Hi everyone, with me today is Eric Turner, a VP of Market Intelligence at Misari, a company focused on crypto research as well as on building data tools for the blockchain industry. The first question, could you, for those who are not familiar with your project, could you briefly explain what Misari are doing? Yeah, absolutely, and thanks for having me. So Misari is a crypto data analytics and research firm. We really want to help our users make uh, the initial decision on whether they want to invest uh, in support, build on a protocol. We help them monitor those protocols and networks on an ongoing basis for any software changes or anything like a bug or a hack or attack. Um, we provide research to help them understand the trends in the industry, uh, emerging sectors and emerging themes. And uh, more recently, we've released some products that actually help people participate uh, through DAOs and other type of tooling. So really, when you go to Misari, um, you can learn everything about a protocol and actually participate in these protocols as well. Thank you, Eric. Misari's uh, mission statement says that you aim to bring uh, transparency to the crypto economy. Uh, could you talk a little bit uh, about DAOs and uh, the role that DAOs uh, can play in this process of bringing transparency to the crypto industry? Yeah, so we personally, are, or you know, we as a firm really think that DAOs are the future of many organizations. It's still very early uh, in DAOs. There's still a lot of problems with DAOs, just around organization and um, you know, really allowing people to participate in DAOs. But if you think about where we are today in the industry, we have protocols that will eventually be trillion dollar protocols. We have protocols that will be managing hundreds of billions of dollars in their treasuries. And the only way you can do that in this industry, in the blockchain industry, because it is so global, is through a system where everybody can see what is happening and everybody can understand um, the changes that are being made on these protocols. So when we look at DAOs, we think of it as a combination of on-chain and off-chain transparency. Um, we do a lot of work to help synthesize what's happening in discussion forums and things that are um, early proposals for these protocols all the way through what's actually happening on chain. So when you have votes and eventually up to execution, uh, the unique thing about DAOs is you always know what the roadmap looks like and you always know where things stand because you can see that combination of off-chain and on-chain uh, conversation and execution. So uh, we're big believers in DAOs for multiple reasons, protocol management, um, bringing communities together, uh, investing, whatever it may be, uh, we think it's going to be a big industry. How far away are we from uh, using DAOs in a broader context? I mean, outside the crypto industry for managing like real world uh, organizations? I think we're still five years away from really doing it well in crypto. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, we will see this replace a lot of inefficiencies within organizations. Um, you know, personally, I don't believe that we're going to get to a world where DAOs replace all organizations at all levels. I think there's a lot of uh, efficiency that can be made within organizations. So if you look at the DAO model today where DAOs have sub DAOs and committees being built internally to tackle specific problems, maybe treasury management, uh, marketing, you know, whatever it may be, I think that will carry over a lot once we get it right into traditional organizations um, where organizations either internally will have some sort of decentralized infrastructure to allow maybe their users or employees or whoever it may be to participate in decision making. Um, but I also think that there will be a world where organizations work together using DAO infrastructure. So there could be a lot of uh, coordination through this. But again, I think a lot of that tooling, even in our industry where we're, we're doing all of this and we're really thinking about it 24 seven, um, that tooling's just not there yet. So it, it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, coming back to your mission statement, it uh, also says that crypto will uh, democratize access to information. Could you uh, talk a little bit about that? And also another question is, could uh, uh, crypto and uh, blockchain also have an impact on the quality of information people are getting? Yeah, so we're in a unique place where everything that happens is public and you can see it on a public ledger, you can see what's happening on chain, but it's also very difficult to understand, uh, especially as you see new networks and new protocols emerging where data structures are different and people might not know which tooling to use. So 
the way we see it, there certainly will be an in increase in transparency. And this is similar to what we were saying with DAOs, but you'll be able to see you know, anything that's happening on chain. You'll be able to see any changes that are being made on these protocols and on these networks, but we still need more tooling. So there are people, you know, people are working on these things. We're certainly working on it. It's standardizing the data. It's making the data comparable from network to network. Uh, without that context, it really doesn't matter. Um, so that could be a combination of research, like from our research analysts, or just basic tooling, where again, it standardizes things and you can say network A is here and network B is here, and people can just understand those things without needing to dig into a block explorer or using some of the basic tooling we have now. Mm -hmm. Now, could we look at the bigger picture? Uh, the world's economy is in disarray now. Under these circumstances, how do you see the role of the uh, blockchain industry and uh, DeFi? Uh, what, uh, uh, what impact uh, can they have uh, under these circumstances? Yeah, I think the way I look at DeFi and the way we look at it you know, as a firm is really from two perspectives. So there certainly is the aspect of DeFi where we are today where even over the past year, you've seen so many people be able to access new financial opportunities. People that didn't have basic banking infrastructure, they can borrow, they can lend, uh, they can trade, they can make new investments, they can hedge those investments with derivative protocols. DeFi is evolving very rapidly. And if you look at the participation from around the world, uh, it is coming from people in first world nations and people in countries that, again, didn't have these opportunities. And with the centralized organizations, they're now investing, they're now participating. Uh, we believe that you know, that financial aspect of DeFi is still very early, but incredibly promising. And the other side of it is DeFi is building a lot of composable primitives that are gonna power not just the financial side of things where maybe you can borrow, lend, and invest as an individual, but it's going to be the underlying infrastructure for everything that happens within Web3. So if you think about what's happening within GameFi, within NFTs, the financial aspects of that are very, very early, but DeFi is gonna be powering a lot more than just what we've seen in DEX and lending and you know, some of those basic protocols. Mm -hmm. My next question is about anonymity in crypto. Uh, do you think uh, crypto wallets uh, should uh, remain anonymous and users uh, should be able not to reveal their identities? Because there have been arguments uh, that uh, anonymity could uh, help uh, people cover up uh, criminal activities, but on the other hand, there is uh, an argument uh, that um, anonymity could help people who live under oppressive regimes. What's your take on that? <laughs> it's a hot topic for sure. Um, the way that I think of it is we, all of this started to empower people. And if you consider what a criminal is, like you said, in an oppressive regime, a very normal person doing just living their daily lives could be labeled a criminal. And you're right, you know, if you have that KYC or you have something in a wallet for that individual where it's forced upon them, um, I do not think that's where this industry needs to go. I think if that's where we're headed, why are we doing this in the first place? We're just recreating everything that exists in the real world. We're gonna end up with siloed, regulated networks, chains, whatever it may be. Um, I think really when you look at everything that's happening on chain with wallets, with protocols, and anything that's on chain in, in this crypto space, uh, KYC and, and you know, all of that goes against that. Now, I'm not saying that KYC shouldn't exist. I think if you look at some of the on and off ramps where you're actually interacting with existing banking rails and you're interacting with some sort of currency within a country, um, I do think that KYC can probably be justified there. But if you're talking about crypto wallets and crypto protocols identifying their users, again, I would rather air towards the side of somebody being a good actor and a good individual, I think that is usually the case in this industry. It's not people using it for nefarious or criminal activities. Um, and we need to protect those people, again, that are using it to actually escape their current situation and try to find new opportunities and really, you know, whatever it may be, oppressive regimes or just really poor economies where they just don't have those opportunities. Uh, we shouldn't restrict people from that. Mm -hmm. Now, mm, let's talk about some issues that the crypto industry is facing, like uh, scalability has been um, one of those issues uh, for quite a while. At this point, 
how close are we to solving that issue? <laughs> uh, I think scalability really is something where you can look at it from two perspectives. You can look at it for maybe one of the major networks like Ethereum, what scalability means for Ethereum. So are we there with layer twos and other solutions? Uh, I think we are getting there. I think if you look at what scaling is on Ethereum specifically today, there's still some things to work out. You know, there are wait times moving between uh, an L2 and an L1. Uh, there is you know, some of inefficiency with these L2s. I think the scalability, once you get funds, tokens, whatever it may be, onto these second layer solutions, they're fast, they work well, and there are things being built on them. But I also think if you think about scalability, the other way that it's really being solved and you know, something we believe in is mul this multi-chain future where some application specific chains may be faster than others and you deal with speed and security trade-offs between the two. So maybe not every chain needs to be incredibly fast. Maybe some need to be fast for gaming transactions and maybe some are fine being a little bit slower and a little bit less scalable if you're dealing with, again, something like large financial transactions where you want to have additional security, you don't really want to make trade-offs. And that's what this space is all about. I think it's the trade-off between what you can do very fast, what kind of security you have, and all of those aspects. And you have to look at it that way when you're thinking about what chain to use or if a chain is really scalable. Um, I do think that three to five years from now, this multi-chain world, you, you will almost abstract away which network you're interacting with. And you'll have interfaces that you can choose uh, that ability to move funds fast or build something very fast, high throughput on the back end of an application that you're building. Um, and you'll still have that infrastructure where you can deal with something and, and have a chain that's a little bit more secure, maybe a little bit more slow, or even a little bit more expensive. Mm. You've mentioned this multi-chain world, but there is uh, another issue, <coughs> which is uh, inter-chain communication. Uh, how efficient uh, is uh, inter-chain communication now, and uh, what uh, do you think can be done in this direction? I'd like to tell you that it's very efficient. Uh, it's not, I think. <laughs> I think if you think about where bridges and all of these other solutions are today, we're not even, we're maybe a year or two into them actually working and people actually using them. And if you think about all of these networks, the really you know, more mature networks like Bitcoin and Ethereum and some of the other layer ones, it took years to get where we are and you go through a lot of, you know, uh, I, I think it's that test in production type mentality where these are live and you're going to have things happen. You will have funds lost. You will have hacks, attacks. You know, you're always dealing with people trying to stress test uh, what's happening on these protocols. I think a lot of these bridges are starting to work well. And if you've used them, you know, they are almost a magical experience. They really do uh, allow you to move between protocols and move between assets. And really, you know, they're, they're interesting. But they're still new. And I think we're gonna see some growing pains as those get built out. But I don't think we're that far away from this multi-chain world. I think within a, you know, five years maybe, three to five years, I always think of that as a time frame of how speed moves in crypto. Um, we will have very easy to use solutions where you can move between chains and um, you know, again, wrap assets, move them between chains, whatever it may be. I think it's sooner than we think, but I, again, think we're going to have some, some small growing pains in there as well. Mm. I, I'm also going to ask you about decentralized exchanges uh, versus centralized exchanges. Is it uh, correct to say that uh, more, most recently DEXs uh, have been uh, winning users uh, over uh, from centralized exchanges? Yeah, I think it again, it's always about trade-offs, but um, I did hear somebody the other day, uh, you know, a, a large asset manager say, once you use a DEX, you never go back. They think it's, a, they think it's just a very, you know, again, and I, I, I think a lot of this in this industry is that magical experience where uh, you feel in control and you feel like you have endless possibilities on what you can do. I'm, you know, I'm sure you remember with centralized exchanges, it used to be the winner would be the one that could list first and have the most assets. And if you look at everything that exists in this industry today, and if you think about, again, not just the trading aspect of it, but a DEX being able to power intergame operability, NFT interoperability, all of the things where you're swapping assets for reasons other than just investing, 
Um, that infrastructure has to be built on decentralized exchanges, and you can feel that magic of endless possibilities, endless assets, tokens, whatever it may be. When you use a DEX, um, I don't think that centralized exchanges will ever go away because they still do have a lot of speed and they have you know, that user base of traders that are going to want some of the advanced tooling and you know, the um, kind of white glove approach that maybe a more institutional focused centralized exchange can offer them. But I always think of it as, yes, a lot of this is about, about the financial side of things. It's about trading and investing. That's where DeFi started. But things like DEXs and all of these protocols and primitives, they're going to power so much more than that. And you're going to need permissionless, decentralized, composable protocols to move adoption forward in this industry. And finally, let's talk about the current state of uh, crypto adoption in general. Do you think it is fast enough? Uh, could anything be done to speed up this process? Yeah, I think it all comes down to use case. Uh, I was having this conversation with someone the other day, and if you look at some of the pushback in the industry now, it's no longer coming from people that are familiar with finance or banking. You know, that was what we dealt with early on. You kind of go through these waves. Bitcoin dealt with the banking and the financial side of things, and that has become almost mainstream and normal now to think about Bitcoin as an asset. And then you move to Ethereum, and Ethereum was dealing with more of the technical side of things, understanding smart contracts and what this tech infrastructure means. Um, and now I think you're looking at adoption coming from new parts of the world. You're looking at it from uh, the social side of things. You're looking at it from art communities, from gaming communities. You're bringing in, every time we go through these adoption cycles, you're bringing in millions, tens of millions, potentially hundreds of millions of people. So we're not there yet in terms of global adoption. We're really, really far, a lot farther than I would have thought we would have been a few years ago. Um, and again, it's because of new applications. It's because of things like NFTs and GameFi and people coming into the crypto space, not because they're looking at this from a, you know, Bitcoin is digital gold or Ethereum is world computer or whatever the narratives we had years ago were. They're just looking at this as, I think this is interesting. I want to buy this profile picture. I want to buy this piece of art. I want to play this game. And that's how they actually get into the industry is then they realize, wait, these are assets that I can use to do other things. I can trade these. These have value. Uh, and that's what's incredibly fascinating to people. So we're going to get, you know, these, the, you're going to go through those again, they're growing pains. You're going to think about people coming in and uh, people in the gaming community not understanding it and a lot of education needing to, needing to be done there, the art community, whatever it is. That's what we're dealing with right now. But once that education happens and it, it's not, you know, quick, it, it, it might take a year, it might take two years, it might take three years to educate people on uh, what's happening and what these things are. I think that's where you start to see the adoption. I think it's not that people get forced into, Crypto is good, you should use crypto. It's what you're already doing in your life could be made better with a blockchain or with a crypto asset. So once people realize that and they start playing around with things and just you know, learning a little bit more, I think that's where you see adoption, not just for nascent individual sectors of the industry, but for the industry as a whole. Thank you, Eric. It's been really insightful. Thank you. Thank you for having me.